Good morning, church. If you have a Bible, go ahead and get it out and turn to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. Thank you, Ron and Tom, for leading us this morning in worship. We gather together this morning, we continue on with our series, Vital Signs. You remember the, sorry, my contacts are drying out. If, um, so if I do this, don't worry, I'm not like checking out on you guys, new contacts. So, um, Vital Signs, remember it's uh, the level of health or the level of life, uh, depending on what you're checking for. So what about us as believers? What are our vital signs? Uh, So we've went through several. Our vital sign today for the Christian life is a truly faithful heart posture. And what what do I mean by heart posture? I ran across this idea a long time ago in a book called Transformational Discipleship by Eric Geiger, Michael Kelly, and Philip Nation. But a working definition of heart posture would be the state of our heart in relation to the presence and work of God in our lives and in the lives of those around us. In terms of having a faithful heart posture, it requires a vulnerable humility, a soft heart, and a willingness to wrestle with and submit to the leading of God in all areas of life. So what does the psalmist David teach us about possessing a truly faithful heart posture? So if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word as we read Psalm 25. David writes this, he says, Lord, I appeal to you My God, I trust in you. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies gloat over me. No one who waits for you will be disgraced. Those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you. All day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they have existed from antiquity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my acts of rebellion in keeping your faithful love. Remember me because of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and upright, therefore, He shows sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches them His way. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth to those who keep His covenant and decrees. Lord, for the sake of Your name, forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. Who is this person who fears the Lord? Who will show him the way he should choose? He will live a good life, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear Him. And he reveals his covenant to them. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he will pull my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am alone and afflicted. The distresses of my heart increase. Bring me out of my sufferings. Consider my affliction and trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies. They are numerous and they hate me violently. Guard me and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and what is right watch over me, for I wait for you. God, redeem Israel from all its distresses. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, hopefully in a truly faithful heart posture that we Submit ourselves humbly before you to be available for you to speak to us. 
Because your words are the words of life. Your words show us the way. And so, Father, for the next few minutes, focus our hearts on what you have for us. Reveal the, the secret things of your will to us. In the next few moments, may we experience your goodness and faithfulness. Lord, we love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So the psalmist that is writing here is obviously none other than David. And in thinking about matters of the heart and heart posture, we can probably take a good idea of what it means to live a life with a faithful heart posture from him. I mean, after all, David is known as what? The man after God's own heart. In order to seek after God's own heart, one must be in a place that is prepared to receive and act on what we see, what we hear, and what we feel from God's heart. This psalm in particular, though, is not a bubbly like, yay! It's, it is actually a psalm, it's a prayer of lament. Seeking the Lord in the midst of trials and troubles of life. In our trials and troubles, this is when we see most often God the clearest in our lives. So in the midst of this trial and trouble, what does David say about us, our heart, and our God. So a few things to take away. A truly faithful heart posture is one that approaches God in trust and desire. A truly faithful heart posture is one that approaches God in trust and desire. We see David express his trust to the Lord. Look how he starts Verse 1, he says, Lord, I appeal to You, my God. I trust in You. Other versions say, To You, O Lord, I lift up my soul. This is a Hebrew expression, an idiom, meaning I direct my desire. David is directing his desires to the Lord. One of them being his desire to trust. Lord, I want to trust you. He trusts the Lord. Even though, as we'll read a little later, his world, in his world, his enemies are acting treacherously and coming closer. David points out that no one who waits on the Lord, what is that? We sometimes like when in our culture, when we think we're waiting on somebody, like Somebody's late, you know? So for us, when we're told to wait on the Lord, we're like, well, how long is He going to take, you know? But what it means is to, it's a, a play on words that means living faithfully to the Lord. Being faithful. So the ones who are faithful to the Lord will not be disgraced. Those who trust in the Lord will not be disgraced. So, are our hearts in a place where we trust God when the circumstances of our lives don't make sense to us? Do we trust God even when His timelines are different than ours? Do we trust God in His sovereignty that He knows what is better Always. We also see here a trust, and not only that, but we see David's desire. We see a desire for God's wisdom and guidance for life. David asks the Lord to make his ways known to him, his ways and paths is a way of saying the way of life. David wants to live a life faithful to God. He wants to live rightly. He wants 
to please God by the way that he lives. But David, if we know his story, in his humanness, didn't exactly hold up to that end of the bargain all the time, did he? In his humanness, David humbly admits that he doesn't know how to do that. I want to live rightly. God, show me your ways. And please show me because I I can't figure this out myself. I need you. He asks God to teach him. He asks God to guide him in his truth. Because the Lord is the one who has saved him. We see that David waits expectantly for the Lord. He isn't going to try to figure this out on his own. So do we long to live lives in a way that pleases God? When we think about the words in, that we like to use in our church culture, Lord and Savior, do we genuinely live them out? Do we actually live as though Jesus is both the Savior and Lord of our lives? The word Lord means ruler. Is your heart, is my heart in a place where whatever Jesus says goes? Whether that's setting something down or obediently picking something up. About eight months ago, obediently picking up and moving a family here. Does whatever Jesus say in your life, is that the top? Is that what goes? We also see here not only David's desire to trust, his desire for God's wisdom, but we see his desire to be forgiven. Like we all desire to be forgiven, but thinking about heart posture in living a faithful life to the Lord, this requires a heart set on following God's leadership and commands. And the bad news, church, is we can't do that on our own in our own strength. The standard is too high. We must be forgiven where we fall short. And we must be forgiven in order to rely on God's power and strength to live out what He asks of us. We must be made right. A heart that wants to please God must be a heart that wants to be reconciled with God. We cannot have that reconciliation with Him until He forgives us though. So we see in David's life, a desire to make sure that things were right between him and God. Do you and I worry about the way that we live? Whether or not each and every act pleases God. Now hear me. We are bound to fall and make mistakes and sin against Him. Sometimes it's deliberate, sometimes it's not. But does our heart desire to make things right with God. I'll give you a a real life example. Um, My wife uh, in Grace Marriage the other day, we had a conversation uh, because that's what you do for part of it. And um, I asked, are you okay too much? You okay? You okay? You okay? And sometimes when I know I have screwed up, I will go to Kelly And I am guilty a thousand times of saying, are we okay? Are we okay? How many of y'all have ever done that with your spouse? Are we okay? After a a conversation, are we okay? Why do we do that? We do that because we desire for 
for things to be good between us and our spouse. We don't want anything separating us in our lives with our spouse. We don't want anything to cause division between us and our spouse. Why? Well, hopefully, there is joy there. There is life there. For David and for us, it's the same thing. A truly faithful heart posture is one that we, in our heart, are always like, Lord, is there anything in me that I need to repent of? Is there anything that is keeping me separated from You? Because I want to get it out. I want to get rid of it. I want to put it aside. Second thing, a truly faithful heart posture is one that acknowledges God's goodness and faithfulness. A person that has a faithful heart posture humbly acknowledges how God has shown Himself faithful in his or her life. James chapter 1, he says, Every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. Coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So how does David, you know, like actually fleshing this out, how does David acknowledge God's goodness and faithfulness in his life? Well, in verses 8 through 15, he shares how God has shown him the way, the way of truth, the way of life. David tells us that those who humbly submit to the Lord, in His guidance and direction, they experience true life. They experience His goodness and His faithfulness. Why? Because the Lord is good and upright. But here's the thing. In God's goodness and uprightness, in His perfection, it would be totally justifiable for Him to keep us at an arm's distance at all times. But that's not what He does. He doesn't leave us alone in our own imperfections and sins. But what does it say? In His faithful love, He shows the way to sinners. In His faithful love, He shows sinners the way. He shows them the way of repentance and faith. And He blesses those who show follow-through. We like people who show follow-through, right? They're always checking up on things, make sure everything's on the up and up. God blesses those who follow through on their trust and desire for the things that He loves. David even reflects on God's goodness and faithfulness in his ability to forgive his sin. This acknowledgement comes in a personal relationship with God. If you think about verse 12, who is the person who fears the Lord? He will show him the way he should choose. The Lord is almost portrayed as an older friend or a mentor. How many of us in our lives have one of those people that you could go to with any question and you know they're going to at least point me in the right direction? They may not give me the exact answer. We've all had people in our lives like that. David says the one who fears the Lord is the one whom God shows the way, making the best decisions. When we humbly heed the advice of this older friend and mentor, i.e. the Lord, we will live a good life. We will be left with an inheritance if we are faithful to the promise. He mentions the inheritance of the land. Now this was a promise derived from 
his covenant with the Israelites, but for believers in Christ, is there not an inheritance waiting for us if we remain faithful to him? This deep relationship with the Father allows us to receive his secret counsel. Now, when I read this the first time, I was like, ooh, secret counsel, tell me more. Like, sounds like some, like, inner room poker game or something out of a mafia movie, you know? Like, oh, that's where the information really gets shared right there. Like, if God has one of those places, I want to know about it. I want to be there. What is this advice or counsel or the secret sauce of life? But the Hebrew word here conveys the idea of confidentiality. The Lord is like having a secret circle of confidants. Those who receive this counsel are only the ones who fear Him. Not literally afraid of Him, but they listen to Him. And they trust His Word just like an intimate friend. So this begs the question, do we have a close personal communion with God? Are you so close to Him that you can go to Him like a close friend or mentor and really seek out the wisdom or the secret sauce of life and receive it? Those who are close to Him, those who fear Him, listen intently to Him and obey Him are the ones that He shares that wisdom with. In the way of how to live life so that that would lead to blessing. Are you, am I, willing to humble ourselves and genuinely seek Him and genuinely listen to Him? Um, I listen to a, a lot of racing podcasts. I know that shocks a lot of you. Earth-shattering information there. But I love the ones where they interview the guys who have been around the sport for decades and decades and decades. Some of these really famous old racing mechanics and crew chiefs, much less the drivers. The, the old mechanics and crew chiefs sometimes are a little crotchety. You know, like they're kind of like the grumpy old men, you know. But one of the things I always appreciate on these old podcasts is when listening to guys who are now at the end of their time, you know, of the sport, or they've just recently retired from the sport, when they talk about the guys who mentored them, like back in the good old days, and you listen to stories about the stuff that they used to make them do when they first met them, but eventually, the story genuinely, most of the time, turns to a place where most of them shared their wisdom, albeit about race cars, but they shared their wisdom with those that they had close relationships with. And it was just a handful of people. These young guys who were there who genuinely listened to them and loved them for it. There was a you know, in these tiny little shops, there was an intimate, close quarters working relationship in the shop day in and day out. And these crotchety old crew chiefs, they would share what they knew, everything that they knew, every trick up their sleeve to those who were willing to sit down with them and listen to them. And those who listened usually reaped success, blessing. Those who were committed not just to listen, but committed to the sport. The cool thing is listening to these guys reflect back on that time of their lives about how much these other older, wiser, sometimes crotchety guys had an impact on them by what they shared. 
Now, our God is much, much better than a crotchety old crew chief. But we can go to Him, and He is willing to share with us everything in order to receive His blessing. But we have to listen to Him. We have to be in a a heart posture that we're willing and humble to hear what He's going to tell us and, and, and live it out. And obey it. So do we closely and intimately keep our eyes on the Lord in faith as our true source of help? Do we want to know how to truly live? Are we listening when God speaks to us? Or are we in a heart posture to even receive what God has for us? Last thing is that a truly faithful heart posture asks for God's help. A truly faithful heart posture asks for God's help. This has been sort of a a cool little psalm up until this point. Then it gets really depressing. Because David's like, I'm surrounded. My enemies, they're coming for me. They're gunning for me. They're coming from everywhere. But David, in a heart posture of humility, approaches the Lord for help. Why? Because he knows that no one can help him in a situation like this except God alone. David says, turn to me. And you're like, shouldn't God be saying to David, turn to me? But this is an expression that says, look favorably at me in in my direction. David lists several specific situations that he has no control over. Here are some, here are some of them if you sc- scroll through there. He's alone, he's afflicted, he's distressed in heart, and that emotion's growing by the day. And he's surrounded by numerous enemies who hate him violently. But David turns to God for help with this huge problem. David, in a humble heart posture approaches the Lord and admits that he can't do it. Lord, I cannot do this. I cannot handle this by myself. David cannot solve the problem. And he admits that he needs God to show up in a big way. But not only is he asking for help in humility, He is going to wait on God in a humble heart posture. Now, if enemies were threatening me violently, I would have a very difficult time of waiting patiently on the Lord. Wouldn't you? (laughs) I mean, but yet, what is that waiting? Remember we talked about earlier. It's trusting. God's going to show up And he's going to work on his time, and his time is better than my time. I don't know how, it's all better than daylight savings time if you ask me, but. But David, in his prayer request, he says, guard me, rescue me. But in the same prayer, David says, I will wait for you as I take refuge in you. Essentially, in our day and time, David would be saying, I don't know when you're going to show up or how you're going to show up, but I know that you will in your time and that that will be the best thing. Ultimately, David won't be put to shame because of God's faithfulness and goodness. The things in our lives that we need help with God may not respond in the way that we hope He does, but we can trust that His way is always the best way. Where do we know this? Romans 8.28 We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. We talked about this a little bit in men's breakfast yesterday. This is a very misquoted scripture like, well, it's all going to work out for the good. 
It says it's all going to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. There is a, a submission, a truly humble heart posture before God. Those are the ones who it's all going to work out for. Today we celebrate communion. It's a picture of the gospel. Jesus in a perfect heart posture at all times towards the Father lived a perfect sinless life. Then He shed His blood on the cross as a sacrifice in our place, our substitute. But He also endured God's wrath on our sin on our behalf. How terrifying was this prospect even to Jesus that in the Garden of Gethsemane He sweat drops of blood. And as He is sweating drops of blood, Jesus prays the most truly heartfelt, perfect heart-postured prayer. In Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, He says, Father, if You are willing, take this cup away from Me. Nevertheless, not My will, but Yours be done. So when looking all these descriptions of the faithful heart posture towards God, the main thing that we see is submission, humility before God, and, and that leads to submission to Him. Is He truly your Lord? Does your heart truly want to humbly come before Him and submit to Him? Where do you, where do I need to change our heart posture before Him? Does your heart have a reverence and respect, but yet a love and hunger for who He is and the things that He loves? Maybe you're here today and you've never humbled yourself in heart posture before God at all and acknowledged your need for Him. He has met your greatest need, salvation. If you come to Him in repentance and faith, He promises to forgive you and give you eternal life and to walk with you through this life. Are you willing to come before Him today in a heart posture that is humble? We think about Peter's words. We'll close with that. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on Him because He cares for you. And when we do that, you scroll down in that passage in verse 10, he says, The God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself... He will do this Himself. He will restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you've suffered a little while. To Him be the dominion forever. Amen. That is who our God is. Church, a heart posture is important. Because if we don't get our heart posture towards God right, we're not going to get much of anything else right. Do you and I, are we guilty of coming to God with a posture of like this? Or like this? Or like this? Or is our posture this? Where we are willing to do whatever He tells us. Whatever He asks of us. Because we know that His Truth and His wisdom is the greatest truth, the greatest wisdom. That's who our God is. So we best take heed of what our heart posture is before Him. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to the, the, the end of this time before we lead into communion, Lord, help us to Think through where our hearts are before You. 
Lord, maybe there's some in this room who have soft hearts, that their hearts belong to you, that they are in a heart posture of reverence, a heart posture of desire to know you, to live faithfully to you. And maybe there's some hearts in here, maybe they were soft at one time, but they've become hard. They've become hard to you, to your ways, to your wisdom. Lord, I pray that you would soften these hearts. Lord, that we would be a church found to be a people who are postured before you faithfully. Lord, help us to be that because we cannot do that on our own. It takes you. It takes your strength. It takes your wisdom. It takes your guidance. So Lord, please show us the way. Show us your ways. So that we can live faithfully in a way that pleases you. Because you alone are worthy of praise for all that you have done in our lives and all time. Lord, we love you and we give you this time of commitment. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.